from the Broadcast Center at BCIT's Burnaby campus. This is All Talk Radio. You're listening to 1680 The Crow. Good afternoon, I'm David Nava, and this is your news and sports update at 3 p.m. If you're listening to us from your car, make sure you refill your tank today, since gas prices dropped significantly this Monday. Most stations are selling the liter for $1.93. On the other hand, some of the stations that we recommend you to avoid are the Shell stations at Science World and the one at 41st and Dunbar, which are selling the liter way above the $2 per liter. If you need to full up on Surrey, you will find prices close to the $2 per liter. For the diesel vehicle owners, the prices remain high with the cheapest price reported at $2.23 per liter. This drop in gas prices have been reported in the USA as well, and according to Gas Body Blog, this is due to the decline of the price of all barrels. Housing sales have stagnated in British Columbia, causing a minor drop in real estate prices. With more on this, reporter Evan Smith. Interest rates have spiked and has left prospective homeowners unsure about entering the market. Through a BCREA press release, it is stated that there's been a 45.5% drop in unit sales. Some areas are more affected than others, but a provincial drop in housing prices has been disclosed to be 3.1%. Brendan Ogmanson, BCREA chief economist, talks about okay. the high interest rates that led to this. Does your talk back really button work? No, rates right? At this point. Uh, I think you have to have on the mic and then and have the talk back. But I don't variable know. Variable rates about five and a half percent. Those are uh, uh, interest rates we haven't seen really since about 2007. Unit listings are just now getting back to pre pandemic levels, which were still very low. Evan Smith, 1680, The Crow. The Komagata Maru was recently memorialized as a heritage storyboard in Port Moody's Rocky Point Park, reported Evan Tate with the story. The sign memorializes the 1914 ship that came to Canada carrying Indian immigrants, but was turned away upon arrival. Raj Singh Tor, grandchild of one man aboard the ship, hopes the sign will educate the next generation about our country's past. The descendants of the Komagata Maru Society hopes it will help to connect Canadians, British Columbians and Port Moody residents with their past uh, to build a more peaceful and tolerant tomorrow. After two months without food or water, the ship returned to India. Men who were not immediately shot dead faced five years in prison for their voyage. Evan Tate, 1680, The Crow. The barge beached at English Bay is set for deconstruction of the hull being finished later this week. Reporter Denis Senoglu with the story. The barge has gained an almost cult-like fandom from some Vancouverites, even having a sign put up where the barge is beached with the words Barge Chilling Beach. Nearly a year has passed since the barge drifted to shore last November. Since then, many people in the neighborhood have thought of the barge with fondness. Local man Frank Thompson enjoyed having the barge around, but knew that it was in the city's best interest to have it removed. Well, I don't think you get too many people uh, traveling here just to see the barge. Realistically, long term, it's going to break up. And it was falling apart anyway from the moment it went on the beach, so it's the, the best thing. While the final deadline for removal of the barge is not set, crews are working on removing debris and moving it off-site. Dennis Shinolu, 1680, The Crow. Reporter Dennis Senoglu joins us now from English Bay. Dennis, can you refresh our memory and tell us how did the barge first get to the shore? Yes, David. With the atmospheric river last November causing large amounts of rain, the surge of water alongside high winds and tides caused the SMT 5000 barge to get loose from its anchor and drift to the shore, where it's at right now. And what's the current status of the, the construction project? Well, really only the mid-body of the barge is left. Right now, they're cutting through some internal bracing to skin off the side panels and ultimately get down after that bottom plate. Thank you, Dennis. 
Moving on, Ontario's top doctor is recommending wearing masks and getting vaccinated again due to the current multidemic. Dr. Kieran Moore, chief medical officer of health, says he's strongly recommending masks for the sake of protecting young children. Officials are seeing an extreme surge in respiratory viruses and flu cases present at pediatric hospitals. Yeah, if you've got any vulnerable child in the home, I think it's best we, in essence, try to cocoon that child with masking as best we can. Four and under are very susceptible to RSV and influenza. Dr. Moore says that pediatric emergency and intensive care units province-wide are working at or above capacity as viral infection season hits us earlier than expected with more impact than usual. Dr. Moore says that all of Ontario's hospitals have adopted surge plans to help increase bed capacity and redirect their resources to deal with the uprise of pediatric patients being admitted. The federal government has formally banned the top members of the Iranian regime from entering Canada. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino announced that by tomorrow, thousands of Iranian officials will be deemed inadmissible if they try to enter Canada. Heads of state, members of the cabinet, ambassadors and senior diplomats, members of the judiciary, senior military and intelligence officials and other senior public servants who wantonly violated human rights and support terrorism. This comes after the government announced an intention to pursue the measure about a month ago. Due to the harsh repression and human rights violations protesters in Iran are currently facing, the defense minister also said that this sanction is a fight for justice on behalf of the victims who lost their lives on the flight that was shot down by Iran in Tehran almost three years ago. The suspect in the deadly shooting at the University of Virginia has been taken into custody. The Associated Press reporter Shelley Adler has more. University of Virginia Police Chief Tim Lungo was in the middle of a news conference in Charlottesville when... We just received information the suspect is in custody. That suspect is Christopher Darnell Jones Jr., who officials say allegedly gunned down fellow students in a bus as they returned from a school field trip. Three members of the football team have died and two other students were wounded. University President Jim Ryan... My heart is broken for the victims and their families and for all who, those who knew and loved them. Ryan adds one of the injured students was in critical condition. The other was in good condition at a local hospital. I'm Shelley Adler. And now moving to sports. In the midst of a horrible season, Canucks fans can find consolation remembering the good old times when they see the Sweden Twins and Roberto Longo inducted to the Hall of Fame today at 5 p.m. The Canucks trio was selected in the first level year, a recognition that Longo wasn't expecting for himself. You look around and see all the plaques, you see all the names. Um, it's pretty special. And then the names that were inducted in the last year or two, you know, next to yours. And uh, it's, it's all pretty, uh, pretty special moment for me. I want to make sure I take it all in the next four days. And I'm happy that my family and friends are here to you know, share it with me. The 2022 inductee class will be completed by Rika Salinen, Daniel Alfredson, or Herb Carnegie. And back to the usual Canucks news, the Canucks will hit the ice tomorrow at Buffalo, trying to avoid registering the worst season in the franchise history. After 16 games, Vancouver has even less points than last year, which resulted in the firing of coach Travis Green and general manager Jim Benning after game 26. Uh, to find a season start even worse, we have to look at the 97-98 season. That year, the NHL still had games ending in ties, and after 16 games, Canucks' record was three victories, 11 losses, and two ties, just one victory less than this year's team. It was exactly after Game 16 that the Canucks blew the, blew the team up in 97-98 with the firing of Pat Quinn as president and general manager. Just three games after, head coach Tom Brenny was fired. So if the bad results keep coming, probably we'll see Bruce Woodrow facing the same fate. 
And a symbolic red hat has been selected as the mascot for the Paris 2024 Olympics. The Associated Press reporter Jennifer King with the story. Les friges. La frige olympique et la frige paralympique. It's known as a Phrygian cap and is worn by Mary Ann, France's personification of liberty, who can be found everywhere from schoolrooms to stamps, usually leading the troops during the French Revolution. The two 2024 Olympic mascots are dubbed together Les Friges and look kind of like a pair of floppy red triangles with friendly faces, a tricolor ribbon, and bright sneakers. The Paralympic version features a prosthetic leg. Organizers say they wanted something that represented an ideal and chose the cap as an allegory Stay tuned of freedom for more that embodies on the ability we have when we collectively Everything is changing to digital. Everything is online. People aren't just waiting for the six o'clock news anymore. People want their news right now. They want to be able to go onto their smartphone, onto the internet, and see the news that they want to see. Vancouver is growing at you know a really rapid rate, the Lower Mainland even, and with the tools that we're given here, we're able to cover all of that. Welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Radhika Sikakane. In the program, they really leave it up to you. I mean, the help is there when you need it, figuring out how to use the programs like Premiere, Audition, and figuring out how to use the cameras. 
but it's up to you to sort of experiment and figure out what you can do when you go out in the field. They brought candles and flowers to remember the student who lost her life yesterday. Theresa May says the international community condemns Moscow. They really make sure that you know the basics and you are able to put out a quality product. I'm Brady Tretinero. And I'm Radhika Siggy King. Thank you for tuning in to BCIT Magazine. Welcome to For the Record on 1680 The Crow. I'm your host, Evan Tate, and today we are speaking to Raj Singh Tor, Vice President of the Descendants of the Komogata Maru Society. The ship, which remains a shameful time in Canadian history, was recently memorialized as a heritage storyboard in Rocky Point Park. So Raj, my first question for you is, why is it important that we remember the Komogatu Maru? Yeah, uh, Komogatu Maru is a, uh, it's a, it's a Canadian history, right? And uh, it happened in Canada. Uh, my grandfather, uh, he was a student in that ship, 1914. Uh, he was coming for higher education. They were all British subjects uh, there with a uh, British passport. They were all together 376 passengers. Uh, and uh, uh, there were 346 and uh, 12 uh, Hindus and 24 Muslim. Uh, they were all British subjects, British passport they had. So when they arrived here, uh, uh, the Canadian government denied entry them. And uh, uh, like uh, uh, no food, water, medication was provided by the, the uh, Canadian government. And uh, uh, and only the local South Asian uh, community provided the passengers with food, water, and medications. But that help was uh, limited by the uh, Canadian uh, uh, government because the uh, Canadian uh, officers restricted the South Asian community to assisting the ship. And um, sometimes they have to stay uh, 24 hours without food and water. Sometimes they have to stay two, three days or more. Uh, and uh, passengers were getting sick. And um, uh, even the uh, lo uh, local politicians, such as a federal, uh, whether it's a, uh, uh, a Truman Baxter mayor of Vancouver, they were uh, held, uh, holding a rally against the Kamagata Maru passengers. Uh, they were make the the, uh, the Truman Baxter mayor and uh, and uh, he the, the whole council they they passed the uh, resolutions uh, motions against the Kamagata Maru passenger uh, uh, and also they. Uh, said that uh, uh, ACTX people uh, uh, should be uh, uh, should not be come here. That they should be uh, like uh, deported from here. Uh, uh, and also, same motion was uh, passed by the city of New Westminster. Uh, uh, like uh, against the Kamagata Maru passengers, these passengers should be deported, and the South uh, South Eastern Community ACTX people they should be deported from here. Make a new law. Uh, and deported from here. And these people are serious menace to our civilians, both econ economically and socially. So uh, all the racist commerce openly they were making over there. So uh, after uh, uh, two months, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Canadian government uh, sent the Kamagata Maru back to India forcefully uh, under the shadow of a military ship uh, and uh, by a discriminatory law continue journey passes act. So when they arrived in uh, uh, India, so uh, uh, so uh, British were ruling India at that time. So 20s uh, people were uh, uh, killed on spot. Uh, they, they, the British took shot the passengers. 20s uh, passengers were uh, 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 killed on spot. Many were injured. So rest of them put in jail for a long period of time, including my grandfather. So for protest, most of the passengers joined the freedom movement, including my grandfather. And uh, India got independence in 1947. So Kamagata Maru was the actual turning point in the Indian freedom movement. In 1962, my uh, uncle tried to sponsor him, my, uh, my, my grandfather. He refused. He said, no, he will not go there because he have a painful, bitter memory with Canada. But uh, one day, the Southeastern community will go there. We open the way for them. And uh, they will live very peacefully, successfully here. So you can see here, the Southeastern community is uh, uh, living very peacefully, successfully in every field here. Yeah, and uh, after that, when I came in Canada in 1983, 
then I try to search the uh, uh, the other passenger, uh, other Kamagata or descendants. So then we form the in two thousand five or two thousand six we form the. Uh, descendants of the Kamagata Maru uh, uh, society. And then our goal was uh, the federal government should apologize and the BC government should apologize and the city of Vancouver, city of University should apologize for their role in the Kamagata Maru incident. And we get succeed. And, uh, and uh, in May 23, 2008, on uh, our request, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the BC government apologize in the BC legislature about this act of this discrimination. Uh, and also the uh, um, I, I, uh, 2016, May 18, 2016, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, he apologized uh, in, in the House of Commons. Uh, and uh, I was officially invited there. All the descendants and the South Asian community was officially inv invited there. Yeah, we sat on the uh, gallery and uh, and he stood up from his chair and then uh, he facing us and he apologized from us. Then after that, we had a photo session with the Prime Minister. Then uh, I uh, I think uh, in 2020, uh, I uh, request to the city of Bangkok Council, uh, I tell them, okay, this is the racist motion, I show them, uh, uh, your council was passed, it was a very racist motion, and you should apologize for this racist motion. And on my request, June 2020, uh, 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 Jean Swenson, she brought the motion. I spoke in the uh, spoke the motion. Also, I spoke ten minutes, but about five minutes there. Then after my speech, then the, the city council passed the motion and apologized there. And and the last year they they officially apologized. Uh, 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 in I think in the May, the uh, 2021, uh, and uh, uh, also the. the on my request, the city of New Westminster also apologized uh, in last year, May 27, 2021, for, for the racist motion which was passed by the, uh, uh, the previous council in 1914. Thank you for explaining that. Um, the incident was recently memorialized at Rocky Point Park with a sign. Um, can you yeah. speak a little bit about what that means for the South Asian community here? Yeah, on April 13, 2021, I gave, gave a request and I spoke in the council meeting and May 13, 2021, I spoke in the Heritage Commission meeting as well. So regarding the Komagata Maru incident, which uh, took place in 1914, I requested, I am wondering if the city of Port Moody can name a park or street or civil or some civic assets in memory of the Komagata Maru passengers. Another consideration could be to install a storyboard at park or plaza. So in 2022, the descendants of the Komagata Maru Society and the city of Port Moody uh, agreed that acknowledge the Komagata Maru incident would provide a meaningful opportunity for the community to reflect on systemic racism uh, in Canada in response that centers of the uh, Kamagata Maru Society and the city of Port Moody work together in this storyboard to increase awareness of the struggles that many went through and to inspire people to fight discriminations uh, and foster inclusion to help us create a, a, a better future. This would mean a lot to the families of those who were on the uh, Komagata Maru and suffered from challenging Canada racist immigration law. Uh, yeah, and also, I like uh, I want to uh, say something here. And uh, uh, the city of Port Moody, uh, I explained them have a direct connection uh, to the Komagata Maru incident. About two thousand South Asian community family lived in BC in nineteen fourteen. And some families lived in Port Moody working in lumber mill as well, who, uh, who helped give food, water, and medication uh, to the Kamagata Maru passengers and also contribute to try to lease the ship in an attempt to keep it from being sent back. The six were some of the, the early pioneers of Port Moody making important contribution to the labor pool for the lumber mill of the area. Port Moody was the one of uh, uh, so one of the uh, first place, places in BC to house significant Sikh documents and the Sikh doc community was very active in local affairs. Support of the passengers of the Kamagata Maru was a very uh, pressing concern for all Sikhs in BC during the summer of 1914. So uh, I also I sent them a 
photos, you know, in 1907, you can see they did a, 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 a storyboard in the Rocky Point Park. So uh, once you can see on, on the left side, so there is a the very near, there is a mill there. So 1907, I had a picture there, the six worker working over there. And, and, uh, and those are the, those pictures I, uh, with the, the city include in that storyboard. So make sure they recognize. Uh, so these are the uh, uh, people who uh, help the, the passengers with food, water, and medication. Even the, that was limited because the Canadian government don't allow to go to the ship. So this, well, they try their best to survive the uh, Kamagata Maru passengers. I want to add something in there. All I want to say that the Kamagata Maru interpretive sign in Port Moody will help educate the community and remind us of how unique Neda and Port Moody diverse makeup is. Uh, and uh, the, so the, we are all richer when we remember how special it is to have to so many different ethnic communities living together. And uh, the descendants of the Kamagata Maru society hopes it will help to connect Canadians British Columbians and Port Moody residents with their past uh, to build a more peaceful and tolerant tomorrow. And we can't undo the past, but we can move forward and leave a legacy for the future generations by educating them about the past. Mm -hmm. That's a great learning tool. Thank you. It's a great message. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for speaking with me, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for tuning in to For the Record. I'm your host, Evan Tate, and you're listening to 1680 The Crow.
I dream a lot about the day uh, that my family will arrive here in Victoria. And I just dream about showing them around, about this place that became my home. Looking back to that moment, I could not bear the, the fear in my mom's eyes. The sponsors are gonna be playing a big part in supporting my family after they arrive uh, to Canada to give them a sense of uh, home and community. So I went to a meeting with, the, with Tam and the sponsors at the Intercultural Society and when I learned the amount of money that needed to be raised to bring his mom and his two sisters here, I was shocked. I was shocked, upset, thinking why does it have to be so much. We have formed a, a sponsorship group of 12 amazing individuals uh, and supporters uh, who reside here in Victoria on the island. And uh, we uh, work with uh, ICA, who's a sponsorship agreement holder. They work in coordination with the Canadian government. And these organizations are giving number of seats uh, every year to uh, sponsor uh, refugees. Uh, we're so lucky to get a seat finally after five years. You know, his um, family is just at a risk. I, I, I have no idea how he manages each day with his mental health. It's actually amazing how he keeps it together. He's such a hard worker. I, he's been working, I know that he's been not only doing that, but school on top of it and doing exams, and he blows my mind. You know, we don't appreciate how good we have it here in Victoria. You know, it's, it's, we live in a very wealthy place, a very safe place, and now we know with Ukraine, like that was thought to be a safe place too, and now it's not safe. Syria was once thought to be a fairly stable, safe country to live in. I just can't believe the circumstances they have to uh, survive each day compared to even third world other countries are, that are out there. It's a whole different level of um, struggle in, in places like Syria. We had met on Zoom the uh, last week, I think, with his two sisters and his mother, and they are really beautiful people. And they live in appalling conditions right now in Lebanon. They're illegal refugees. They're not allowed to work. They can barely put food on the table. They only get, they get by on what Tam can send them in terms of money. There's been quite a few hard days where he just wants to chat with them and until that moment happens, um, he, he has that um, fear in him of like, are they still there? Are they still breathing? And that's a reality for him. Every, every hour, every day. Okay, Adi. Keep going, Sabaho. صباح الخير هاي يا مامي كيفك يا قلبي كيف كان انت هاي ماما كيفي كيفك حبيبي I left Syria there was like an attack from all around the city from different parties and uh, I wasn't sure if I would make it uh, you know out of there alive or not around that time like it was uh, really harsh uh, we had over like 40 uh, missile attack on the city within like two weeks uh, so it was really bad Uh, my mom taught me how to make uh, experience of bread. I used to just watch her make it uh, every Friday or Thursday for the weekend. So, what are you worried about? What are you worried about right now? I'm just making sure everything lines up tomorrow morning. <laughs> you know, like the GoFundMe page, that's... Um, <clears throat> it's an online thing and people you know can read the story and 
um, be inspired that way. But it's to put uh, like uh, just the work of um, making the food and making the scarves and doing the art and and people coming together and giving in, a, in this more concrete and creative way. Are you excited for today? Yes. Yeah. It's finally happening. <laughs> Been lots of planning and, 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 and lots of preparation and just getting stuff done and lots of amazing friends and people helping. So I'm, I'm actually very excited. Not ner nervous at all, I would say. I'm just looking forward to just share uh, my story with everyone. So we were just on our way to the souk. Like I had that feeling in my gut that don't go using that uh, road. You like when I go, like I felt like strongly that uh, we should use a different road to get there. And I was telling my mom like we're almost arguing <laughs> in the street like no I don't want to go there let's take the other one so I insisted not even a minute later um, just hear a high pitch uh, bombing the buildings the sky the land felt like everything was shaking and everything was like crumbling to like a piece of paper uh, and people were screaming blood everywhere uh, it was really scary didn't know if my uh, my sisters were home we didn't know if they are still alive or not and then we are running uh, and to, 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 to our back to our house to see what happened like if my sisters are okay or not and the minutes felt like like Asia it's like lots of mix of emotions. Uh, happy. Uh, feels like home actually with all the people, the love. Uh, really good. <laughs> all three of my daughters will be here today at one point or another, either as artists or organizers. And we all live in the same city and, and I see them frequently. And I just can't imagine being separated from my family as Tan. Pam is from his, so. He's never experienced any of these um, conflicts. Uh, how fortunate I am, and if there's some way I can help, it's nice to do so. I knew it that that home was no longer safe. home. Maybe you can introduce you to one of our amazing artists, Ala, from Ukraine. I have three pieces uh, that um, I donated one, one whole life. Uh, I have my whole entire family in Ukraine right now. And um, we lost two family members already, and um, yeah. So and being involved in Tam's um, fundraising, it it takes you know like when you feel terrible, you need to focus on helping someone else. So your own pain will be less, right? So uh, that's what I'm doing. If I were in her situation son was across the world, um, I would be feeling, um, I think what she said, um, uh, really concerned that he has people around him that would help him out. And, um, and that's what she said, like when we saw it, we talked to her on the video and she was just so happy to see all the good energy that was around him. 
بين حكى حكي هذا الشعور شعور انه امه وبناتها وعندها ابن وحيد م. يعني هو حياتها يعني هي اللحظه اللي اني انا بدي بدي اكون جنب ابني هي عم بحلم فيها بشوفها بمنامي جوال something I really like that my mom wrote me and it just like always uh, was always and, and like still stuck in my mind to this day and she's the first uh, first page in this book is my mom yeah and I always for some reason whatever my mom's write I always write myself here like uh, in Arabic of course that I hope my mom lives forever and ever my loved mom <laughs> like always like and I sign it it's like here <laughs> <laughs> so that's my mom and then and then here I, I did a heart with yeah the, so anyway what she says in here that life is like a train and people in each station they come to like you have new people coming and new people leave some people gonna be good some of them might not be good and uh, and she's saying I really hope that uh, your 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 like life or like your train your life train is uh, is like filled with love and success and you know i always think like especially with food is like food is love <laughs> so i i hope people go now like after they 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 go home they you know get to enjoy a meal made by us uh, and it was lots of learning you know like a uh, good start uh, more to come i think i, I think i think we all did it. Here amazing here. teamwork <laughs> i booked off two of my shifts from the hospital so i can be here um, but yeah we, we all sacrificed time but it was it's worth it we're trying to do something beautiful and uh Amazing, all in good hope and faith for Tam's mom and two sisters. And it'll be incredible once it all falls through and uh, they're here safe. They're awesome. Um, like, sort of, like, they're more inspiring than I even expected. Like, they're so bright and, and hopeful and laughing and smiling and um, just really enchanting people and I made it made me think oh my goodness what is especially as sisters what are they gonna do when they get here I think they're gonna just really do awesome things and really contribute here so um, I look forward to meeting them we just saw my sisters they were like they had minor injuries but we're we're like crying all of us uh, and we held each other and, and, and just like grabbed into them like it, it felt like we've lost them and then we, we, we got them back but that day I will never forget um, yeah I will never forget that day That's cool. Fashion is the foundation of being years, but I think it's also like one of the the greatest factors that will even start discussion about being years. What makes this group so special is because like everybody is, they have their own identity, you know what I mean? Everybody has their own personal styles. 
they have their own special talents and their own creative endeavors. And I don't know, it just we're like the Avengers, dog. <laughs> yeah, we're. Who's who? Um, uh, I'm like Black Widow. <laughs> I'm like Thor because I'm the strongest, and huh? <laughs> one of my biggest wishes to you know work with a bunch of little gears so we can change a big group of gears and even affect the bigger gears out there. All of us are so individually different that we fill gaps in all of us. So I feel like in that aspect, we're flawless. When we're having meetings, some of us are thinking so forward, and then you got other people like just grounding us a little bit. And even in just like the whole dynamic is flawless in that aspect. The Lookbook's gonna be a showcase and also just an opportunity for us to get into the studio way more often. Um, it's a very good starting ground for us to build our own portfolios and show people what we're capable of. Yeah, something like this, I would say is pretty good for tote bag. Yeah. Like, it's not stretchy, it's sturdy. Fashion actually like brings out a character in you. You know, like when you're feeling good, when you're feeling fresh, it, you act totally different. My full name is like Nicholas. <laughs> I never tell people like I never introduce myself as that. The most fulfilling thing that I can imagine out of gears is seeing other people form their own little groups because of us and just doing things like imagine some kids in middle school, high school being inspired to do the same things, even if they don't go anywhere with it. But to start it and just even think about it is super fulfilling. I think we should all just be looking for ways to make money and get grants, get this. If we can get a $2,000 scholarship. It just all goes back to the point of like looking good and feeling good, man. Mm -hmm. It's as simple you know? as that. Yeah. It really is, man. So 100%. You know, if we can be like the poster childs for that, to try to promote, you know, that as much as we can. Fashion and music, there's like that culture, the culture aspect of it, it all comes together through music, through art, through clothing. It just, yeah. co it's very cohesive in that aspect and it's all a part of it. We gotta draw one for the cuts too, like, I Okay, can we look at a calendar? Amazing. I think video games for sure, because I was I, I used to be a big gamer, now I have no time, but I used to be a big gamer, and I feel like the way that they build their character design is just through the roof. Like, they make something that's out of this world, and I'm like, how can I take that and make it real life? I love Naruto. Just the silhouettes that they carry. It's like very, very, it's like drapey. Still kind of on that like Asian, like the kimono type, like squared off sleeves, squared off hems, and I, and cropped and like that type of thing. That was one of my big inspirations before. So I used to always wear like hella crop stuff. Can I say that? Crop stuff and um, like crop pants and like oversized sweaters and stuff like that used to be my thing. And yeah, now it's just, I don't know. Now it's just anime all over really. Just from the positiveness, the light, the colors, everything. I think it's great. And that's what continued to inspire me. We out here in the zoo cooler. Yeah, you know, the, the, this like motto of like looking good and feeling good, I feel like that's something you can live by. Like, I feel like people always limit themselves in the ideas that they want to do and they never really pursue it but if we can show that and like hey it's getting done by a bunch of kids yo that's community right there you feel attachment to that anyone else can do this but they're not who else is going to do it with our positive attitudes who else is going to do it with this welcoming who, who who else who else but us so i feel like this is always driving me because i'm just like i want to be that person that can connect What we see huge potential in Vancouver, and 
You know, it's devastating to see the potential just to stay as potential and not coming out as some something, you know, like legit. No one else is going to do it in Vancouver, then it's going to be us, right? Exactly. Like anybody can do it. No one's done it. The fact that we are so young, uh, it's like hard for people to take like us seriously. You know what I mean? Especially like starting out because we we have content, but not a lot of it. You know, we just got to be about our stuff and push as much dope things as we can to show people that even young people can do it too. We are gonna probably run into conflict with each other just with, through like um, individually or even as a group because, because there's no level of like hierarchy and everything is very flat in that sense, it's bound to create conflict, right? When Gray met Alex and Kathy last summer, Gray had a bad impression of them. I think Gray, if I recall correctly, just confronted them, told them like, I didn't like what you said. I want to know what you meant by it. They just figured it out and they confronted everything with each other. And then now they're here, they're super tight. They just confronted everything with each other. And I think realized that like, the value of their friendship then after confronting things with each other is great. So to start off on that note, it's really strong. In the case of like mental health, I think there is, you do have to give time. That's really important. But we, we also can't leave anybody just rotting alone by themselves, right? None of us are mental health professionals or anything. We're just friends trying to help each other, regardless if we're, if it's for gears or not. Our first lookbook, we were going to style each other. It was just gonna be us. Uh, we had due dates like this week i was supposed to come in telling them my prompts about how i want to be styled and things but we we pushed all those dates indefinitely um until everything's great are you optimistic about the future do you think he's going to figure it out and everything's going to go back to schedule? Like, tell me how you feel about the future. No, I think even when we did our other initial interview as a group on the couch, we even said, like, we know things are going to come up. We know things are going to happen. We're going to have conflicts with each other. And I still expect for all those things to happen. But do I feel confident about it? Yes, it is going to be OK. I strongly believe in that, too. If we just work at it, there's nothing that, like, cannot be done. Wednesday morning, busy Tuesday, so lots of prep, a lot of fries. This is, uh, what do we got here? 300 pounds of potatoes, I guess. My business partner and I, uh, you know, training for Ironman and, you know, had this love of food and fries and poutine and uh, kind of came up, ended up coming up with this concept. I was on SkyTrain with one of my young sons going downtown for an event of some kind and hadn't been on SkyTrain in, in years and came through the New West Station and saw this development and I was like, oh, there's a spot right there. All right, so we got to grab butter and chicken sauce. I won't do that. Usually this stuff I'll work on while I'm doing my openings and uh, and see what else needs to be done. And then we open and then we keep wrapping. We keep doing stuff. Could you just talk about the struggles that are facing Spud Shack right now? 
Uh, gee, where to start? So now we're uh, nine and a half years, I guess, almost, have been open. Just coming up on a, a hopefully a 10 year uh, renewal on our lease. And uh, there you go. Half hour ago, this place was packed, uh, and everyone's happy, and they're enjoying their food, and the music's on, uh, and the energy is amazing. That is such a high, you know, and I think that's why I do it, uh, and I think that's why we've been successful. I think I'm very methodical. I do everything the exact same way every single day that I do this. So I, I reached out to the leasing agent. Matt, I, I would imagine, you know, it's, you know, they've got all that figured out. They already know our lease is coming up. Uh, so right. we'll see what they present. Um, in a perfect world, it would be seamless. Uh, saying that I had missed <laughs> my uh, six month uh, notice to inform them for the renewal, which I had no idea I had to do that. I'm, I'm, I, was, I missed it by a week. Well, I'm not gonna lie, I'm nervous. Um, you know, the, I'm, I'm very positive about the business and the concept. You know, it's been nine years. We've had year over year growth. Yes, it's hot. My fingers are used to it. Uh, obviously COVID hasn't helped, but I, I, we have a strong presence. You know, we're well respected. So in that regard, um, you know, I feel great. What do I do if I don't sign the lease? If I don't renew the lease, do we just pack it in, walk away and cut our losses? Or do we hustle and find another space and basically start over again? Uh, it's sort of the magic, right? You know, just repetition, repetition. They say it takes, what, 40,000 times doing something to master it, so uh, we sell 60,000 plus machines a year, so hopefully we're, we're, we're on the right track and uh, doing it right. Uh, but this this is what matters the most. Saturdays, Friday, Saturdays, we know we're going to have an extra busy weekend coming up. The last couple of years has been COVID. Um, can you talk about how that's kind of affected the business? Um, yeah, well, there's no question it's had a major impact. Uh, we were closed for three months, so you want to talk about a low, uh, I would say mid, you know, by, by the end of March, we had been closed almost two weeks. Um, we didn't know if and when we were going to reopen, you know, uh, if we were just even going to survive being closed for, for a couple months. You know, 2019 was our busiest year. We had done some awesome numbers. Our projections for 2020 were going to be through the roof. We were going to hit some personal milestones and benchmarks that I had set for the restaurant of where I figured we needed to be for expansion and growth. Uh, and we were there and we were going to hit it and then we were kind of punched in the gut. So now we got to figure out how do we get back to there? You know, I think food and the quality and the, and, and the systems are all still there. Now we just need to find the, the labor and the staff and the, peop, the right people that bring us back, get us back to our hours that we need to be, where we can be open and to get back to those numbers. COVID hopefully is in the rearview mirror-ish. Uh, our lease is on the horizon. That looks like, you know, hopefully we're going to get through that um, coming up to summer. So we're going to have a, hopefully some nice warm weather and a nice summer. Uh, and then we can really start looking forward to the future. So um, I think it looks great. From the Broadcast Center at BCIT's Burnaby Campus, this is All Talk Radio.
You're listening to 
Stay tuned for more on BCIT's 1680 The Crow.